I want to tell you about one of the weirdest concert films to ever be released by a major band. I'm talking The Song Remains the Same by Led Zeppelin. But before we get into it, a word from this video's sponsor. Staying on top of multiple credit card balances can make your head spin, kind of like a lot of the things I'm about to talk about in today's video. But thankfully, today's sponsor, Upstart, can make it simpler. Upstart is the fast and easy way to get a personal loan so that you can pay your debt off online and take back your life. Whether you need to consolidate a high interest debt or pay off some credit cards, Upstart can get you a simple, fixed monthly payment for whatever you need. Just go to upstart.com slash cinemassacre and with a five minute online rate check, you can see your rate up front for loans from $1,000 and $50,000. And not only can you get approved on the same day, but you can also receive the funds as early as one business day. Over half a million people have already used it. So find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash cinemassacre. Again, that's upstart.com slash cinemassacre. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. So anyway, Led Zeppelin is no doubt one of the great trailblazers of rock music, along with Jimi Hendrix, The Who, Sabbath, and Deep Purple. They're one of the big ones, arguably the biggest. They were mainly active from the late 60s all throughout the 70s, practically isolated to that era. And with the passing of time, they've achieved that sort of legendary status. As the legend goes, they were better live. You had to see them on stage. You just had to be there, right? Well, fat chance. So, of course, that's where live recordings come in. But Zeppelin was a pretty elusive band as far as live recordings go. For many decades, the only official live release by the band was The Song Remains the Same, both the film and the live album that came with it. Now, we're talking about the same band that refused to allow their Live Aid show from being included on the DVD because the performance wasn't up to par. So that must mean the song remains the same, has to be the real deal, right? May I stress the fact that this was 76 and it was the only live show they released until 2003. Now, picture me in the 90s as a teenager. I'm just starting to get into music. I'm listening to all the Led Zeppelin studio recordings and wondering, what were they like on stage? I've seen pictures of what they look like, but never actual footage. And I heard they were amazing. But this is pre-YouTube and, and the internet barely existed as we know it today. AOL, man. You dial into that shit and it's like, eek! Five hours later, you got mail. So one day I'm at the mall at Suncoast Video where I used to buy all my VHS tapes. I see this sitting on the shelf. This is the actual one. I read the description on the back and it says stuff like explosive riffery and sonic boom rhythm wall. And I'm like, okay, let me check this out. So I buy it with actual money, I might remind you. I take it home. I'm sitting there. I put this fucker in my VCR, I'm sitting there, ready to be blown away. And this is what I see. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fucking fuck? Did you see what I saw? To this day, I have yet to hear another human being translate or even just describe what happens in the beginning of the song remains the same. Even the handful of reviews I've read skip over it. How? Has anyone ever tried to get to the bottom of what this is about? I mean, of course, at its most basic interpretation, it's simply a 1920s or 30s mob shootout. Uh, what that has to do with Led Zeppelin, I have no idea. 
One of the mobsters, I think, is played by their manager, Peter Grant. Sure looks like him. But the more bewildering, unexplained moments include the faceless guy, the werewolf, and the Robert De Niro-looking guy who gets his head blown off, spraying streams of rainbow-colored blood. But the part that has me scratching my head the most is all the stuff on the table. What the hell is that all about? There's a deck of cards with a fucking swastika on it. So is this some kind of Nazi congregation? Are we looking at a war plotting table or some kind of board game version of a concentration camp? What the fuck kind of sick idea is this? Like, What is this all about? After this, the credits start up, reminding us we're supposed to be watching a Led Zeppelin concert film. Next, there's a guy riding a bike. Yep, just a guy riding a bike. No music or anything to accompany it. It's a peaceful, silent scene, in contrast to the madness we just saw. Soon we realize he's a messenger, delivering a letter to singer Robert Plant, who's relaxing by a river with his family. There's children in the scene who I'm guessing are his real-life kids. Now, the kids are playing in a river and are shown fully, frontally uh, nude. It's weird. It's weird. And the album cover, Houses of the Holy, was very similar. I guess in the 70s, child nudity was more accepted. But come to think of it, even in the 90s, it was common. You know that album by Nirvana? One of the best-selling albums of all time? Never mind. Never mind that there's a naked baby on the cover. So anyway, Plant receives the letter. We don't see what it is. Then we cut to casual scenes of the other band members. Bass player John Paul Jones is reading a book to his kids. Then we watch Black Swans in a Lake. Yeah. Then a POV stalker shot approaching someone who's sitting in the grass. It takes a while. And it turns out to be guitarist Jimmy Page. And here comes the payoff. Uh... Okay, so Jimmy Page has glowing red eyes that stare into your soul. I mean, he was into all that occult shit. Next, we see Plant, once again, reading his letter, and then Jones reading what seems to be the same letter, and guess what it is? Tour dates! Oh no! This is tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. It has such a doomy, foreboding tone. Next, we see the band getting off a plane and being escorted in limos surrounded by police. Meanwhile, at the venue, an anxious crowd awaits. We watch the band driving and driving and driving. And finally, we hear the first Led Zeppelin music of the entire film, which is not live. It's the studio recording of that instrumental song, Bronyar, Bro the one named after the Welsh Cottage. It's set to footage of New York skyscrapers and the band sitting in the limo looking bored. So the story here seems to be that the band was enjoying their casual private lives when all of a sudden they had to go on stage. I have no doubt there's a lot of truth to that. Having to always be on the road can wear on anybody. Uh, you see lots of bands suffer from burnout and that has a lot of potential for a documentary to show what they have to go through behind the scenes. But the way it comes off here is that they don't want to be here. You know, they don't want to play music, which is what we came to see. And that's probably not the best message to give. So everything I described so far takes up 13 minutes, but it feels more like 30. And then finally, they hit the stage and begin with one of their most upbeat songs, rock and roll. Just to reiterate, this was my first time seeing or hearing anything of Zeppelin live, and it sounded very jarring to me compared to the studio tracks. It's well known that Zeppelin's live sound was very different with a raw and loose feel. At times, this is what made them so special. But this opener and much of what follows sounded to me very sloppy and chaotic. It turns out that I was not alone. This has been famously described as how we would say, not their best. 
It was recorded at Madison Square Garden over the last three nights of their 1973 tour, so by this point the band was worn out. Maybe this is why they got so timid about releasing their live shows for decades to come. They actually went back and refilmed close-ups later on a soundstage, and by that point Jones had his hair cut, so he had to wear a wig. As far as the performances go, there are some great moments, but overall I don't think it'll give you the best impression of Zeppelin live. So now that I talked about that crazy opening scene and the actual concert, that's all there is to say, right? From here on out, it's just music, nothing else weird. Oh my god, oh my god! Oh, oh god damn, oh, 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 oh shit! I yeah, yeah, okay, um, so let me try to describe that. When John Paul Jones starts playing the keyboard intro to No Quarter, it turns into a giant pipe organ in a cathedral where outside some girls being chased by a bunch of men on horses wearing horrifying painted masks. The screen starts strobing and going into slow motion and extreme close-ups. Then a bunch of glowing bats start flying out and then horse legs are superimposed as the image starts strobing more with ultra quick flashes and negative color. Dude, what the fuck? The main masked man enters a house where he's greeted by a pair of dogs. He takes off his mask and, whoa, it's Jones. Then his kids come joyously running and his wife enters, who is the same woman he was terrorizing. What a twist. Needless to say, No Quarter is a highlight. But there's more. Each band member gets their own fantasy scene to accompany the music, spread out over the course of the film, and I'll get into each of them soon enough. So. In a nutshell, this movie is sometimes concert footage, sometimes music video, and sometimes documentary. Rejecting any coherent chronology, we see the band relaxing backstage, and it's so out of context, I can't even tell what plant is talking about. That feeling that's left everybody, the cosmic energy, everybody goes, yeah, bash. Okay then. At other times, we see fans trying to get backstage passes, and the police dealing with different situations. Another part, we see the manager giving somebody hell about something. Don't fucking talk to me, it's my bloody act. You're the fucking controller of the day, you silly cunt, aren't you? It seems like somebody got into the building who shouldn't have. Whatever the case, it's a good candid demonstration of the kind of problems that arise in a venue and the large personality a manager must have to deal with stuff like that. Peter Grant was a no-nonsense kind of guy. When you think of rock band manager, he's the archetype. At one point, a news clip is shown where he's at a press conference responding to a story how somebody stole money from the band's security box at the hotel. And I can't tell if it's intentional, but I'd like to think, yes, he's flipping the bird. He's giving them all the finger. The documentary scenes are a good idea. It's informative to get a glimpse of all the kinds of trouble that happens with a band that's not apparent on the surface. That could have been its own movie, but the realism clashes with the fantasy elements and it loses all focus. So getting back to these fantasy scenes, the second one is Plants during the title track, the song remains the same, and the rain song. First he's sailing on a boat, then he's taking a sword from someone on a horse, then he's staking the sword into the beach which seems to set the beach on fire. Next, there's a long walking montage. Next, he's leaving a cave and removes his fur coat. I forgot to mention, he's wearing a fur coat. Then he kneels in the woods and picks a mushroom. Is he going to eat that mushroom? Oh, yes, he does. He does. Why did I even doubt that? <laughs> then he's doing donuts with the horse. Look at him go. Then we get this long scenic montage of riding the horse. And sometimes it doesn't really look like he has this horse under control. Next, he has a large bird on his arm. I wish I can give more context here, but there is none. Then he arrives at a castle and sword fights some dude in choppy slow motion. I guess that effect looked cool in the 70s. It ends with the guy falling into the water. It begs the question, whoever he was, what did the director say to him before he did that jump? How did they explain what was going on? You're going to be in a scene with Robert Plant. Yeah, yeah, he's going to knock you into the water with a sword. 
This concert film just turned into a medieval action flick. Plant goes up the tower, meets a woman, and then battles with two knights. One of them gets launched over a set of candles and goes up in flames. So now we have a fire stunt. So going back to the question, there were two directors, Joe Masso and Peter Clifton. I'm unsure how their duties were split up or what their involvements were like, but what kind of direction did they give? What did they say when they were visualizing all this? The most likely guess is that they just let the band get high and do whatever they wanted. Nobody would expect anything to make sense anymore, but there isn't even any clear continuity. The other knight, the one who hasn't been lit on fire, swings his sword at plant, we assume, but the very next shot is this. I, I don't understand the juxtaposition. Like, what is happening here? How do these two shots relate? And this shot specifically, what exactly is happening? I'm actually asking, can anyone tell what is supposed to be happening in this shot? It's so fucking dark and murky, I can't even see anything. Uh, maybe that's one for like an Ultra HD Blu-ray or some shit. Then it dissolves to the flaming sword. Then we see the woman and Plant, but she fades out of the shot. And then Plant stares into thin air and then at the camera. And then it dissolves back to the concert. So did he defeat the other knight? I feel like they left something out. The next fantasy scene is for Jimmy Page during Dazed and Confused, which is one of their more avant-garde songs to begin with because it has that instrumental part in the middle where Page makes all kinds of weird sound effects with his guitar. For their live shows, they'd always extend that part, and that's the perfect time to be transported to a full moonlit night on the side of a mountain where Page climbs a cliff. At the top, he meets a white wizard with a lantern. The wizard was probably inspired by Gandalf since the band were known to be big fans of Lord of the Rings. The same wizard appeared on the original vinyl release of their fourth album, the untitled one that's sometimes called Zozo because of the symbol that represents Paige, but I'm not trying to get too deep into Led Zeppelin lore here. The point is, there's the wizard. So the wizard raises his head, showing his aging face. We zoom in and then he rapidly de-ages. It now becomes apparent it's the face of Jimmy Page. That's what happens when you get high off your ass and climb a mountain. You meet yourself as an old wizard who gets young again, and then there's a flash of lightning and it changes all the way back to a fetus. And then he starts aging forward again, and I must say, all that guitar feedback is the perfect soundtrack to this. There couldn't be anything else. But here's where it gets good. Watch this. Oh yes. Oh yes, I'm all about this. Once that wizard starts waving his rainbow shit, that's where it's at. This movie just got fucking awesome. It's 70s psychedelic perfection. Then we're back to the song and Jimmy just keeps on jamming. By now, I'm so thoroughly zoned out that anything he does with that guitar is so welcome. It must be said that Zeppelin was what they call a jam band, known for lots of improvisation, taking their studio songs and transforming them on stage, stretching them out to what critics would call self-indulgent lengths. This is a moment where I think it works and shows you what Zeppelin was all about live. I think the whole dazed and confused section, both the fantasy scene and the performance, is the best part of the film. This is a good thing to space out to if you're in the right mood or the right, um, you know, state of mind. The last fantasy scene, the final fantasy, if you will, is during John Bonham's epic drum solo in Moby Dick. It's not much of a fantasy. It's more like real life footage of him driving antique cars, motorcycles, and jackhammering bricks and tending cows and just doing random work around the house, having a beer, simple things like that, and more exciting things like driving a race car. So it's more about all his hobbies and is completely different from the surreal, dreamlike nature of the other band member scenes. He's also seen teaching his son Jason to play drums. And Jason Bonham grew up to be a pretty amazing drummer himself. 
And no wonder why, if you have somebody like that as your father, just watch this drum solo. Holy shit, he is so fucking good. I would just play it right here if it didn't get content ID'd up the ass. So with all these performances, there are great moments. Even though I said before that it's not their best, it's still better than what many bands could even strive for. During their iconic Stairway to Heaven, there's a line that Plant adds. Doesn't anyone remember laughter? Does anybody remember laughter? Something about that line stuck with me. And it seems like it's not just me. It's remembered as one of the best ad-libs in rock and roll. I'm not aware if he said it any other times on stage back then, but I'm willing to bet this is where most people heard it first. They close the show with Whole Lot of Love, another long, jammy opus. And by the time it's over, and having sat through this once again, I realize it is a good concert. You're not meant to watch this for musical perfection. You're here to see Zeppelin in their most raw, untainted form. Warts and all, they say. Goodbye. The show is over, the band leaves the venue, and we start hearing Stairway to Heaven again. This time it's the studio recording. They get on the plane, which I doubt actually happened right after the show because it's broad daylight. They take off, and the credits start rolling. Usually that means I can stop commenting, but how could I not comment on this? Offstage sequences were not filmed at Madison Square Garden, nor are they dramatizations of actual incidents which occurred at Madison Square Garden. I'm glad they cleared that up. You know, I thought that shit happened. I hear people say, remember that Led Zeppelin concert at Madison Square Garden in 1973 when Robert Plant set a beach on fire with a sword? Not to mention it was the only time a beach ever manifested at Madison Square Garden. Remember when the whole place was roaming with werewolves, mobsters, faceless Nazis, and masked men on horses? Plant was wearing his fur coat with a hawk fighting off a bunch of knights. People were getting stabbed, lit on fire, knocked into moats, and then a wizard came waving his wand and there were neon lasers and shit and then page turned back into a fetus that would have been one hell of a show and as the credits come close to an end i'd like to remind you stairway to heaven is still playing in fact the song isn't even halfway over but the movie is over it makes you wonder why would they have chosen an eight minute song when they had many other options because you know zeppelin does have other songs besides stairway to heaven but the movie's over, so what do you do? Show a black screen. Yes, you are left to stare at a black screen, or on the DVD, it's a lousy still frame of a bird which says, Exit Music, and it stays there just to finish the song out for five minutes. I guess that's the best choice. I mean, Stairway to Heaven is one of those songs that has to be finished. That and one by Metallica. Those songs build up. Once you start it, you have to make it to the end. Have you ever been driving home and you're almost there, but a good song comes on the radio, so you drive past your house and go around the block a few times until it's done? That's what this movie just did. To sum it up, this film is a mess, but it's a fascinating mess and you have to give them credit for trying. With its mixture of stage performance, fantasy, documentary, they tried it all and weren't afraid to experiment. Rather than just releasing the usual concert recording, they pioneered the idea of the concert film. Later bands would try it out, like Metallica with Through the Never. It's similar with its use of fantasy scenes. And I bet even Spinal Tap took inspiration, making fun of its documentary aspects and backstage debacles. I do not and need to stress do not recommend this for a newcomer to Led Zeppelin. Only if you're already a big fan or just have an interest in bizarre, trippy material from the 70s. If you are a newcomer and if you want to hear a great example of their live performances, Definitely listen to How the West Was Won. That's what you call a great live album. But when it comes to live footage, check out the DVD from 2003. I don't know if there's any streaming options. It's a compilation of different Zeppelin concerts between 1969 and 79. Think of it like a highlight reel. 
But another great option is Celebration Day, the 2007 reunion show, which was their first full-length set in 27 years and their last ever. For five years, the only way to see it was on bootlegs until the band finally decided to release it officially in 2012. That's the elusive legendary Zeppelin for you. It's on Blu-ray, but again, I don't know what the streaming options are. I recommend this one because it's a great set list. The songs are selected appropriately, representing the most mandatory highlights of their catalog. And it's an HD with the best visual and audio clarity the band has ever been recorded in. It's as if the legends returned just so history could be captured properly. The only thing, obviously, there's no John Bonham on drums. He died in 1980, but his son Jason fills in and is the most perfect replacement you could ever ask for. The band is clearly much older, but they prove they still got it. If you shut your eyes and just listen, you wouldn't even know they aged. So in a nutshell, if you want to see them from the classic era with John Bonham, get the original DVD, but if you want the best overall production, check out Celebration Day. But if you're only just hearing their music for the first time, check out the studio recordings first. They've covered practically every style of rock music. They've done bluegrass, folk, some elements of jazz, funk, and a dash of proto-metal. There's something in there for everybody. Music is like nutrition. For example, Slayer might be your meat and protein, but with just a little bit of lead in your diet, you get all your vitamins. 